It is with great pleasure that I guide us all through this afternoon's celebration. My name is Aniona Jones, and I will be your master of ceremonies for this afternoon's celebration. It is with great pleasure that I acknowledge the presence of Dr. Maurice Smith, registrar at the University of the West Indies. And of course, this afternoon's celebration would not be possible without the work of Dr. Paulette Ferreira, a woman who I have come to admire, not just as an educator, but as a Christian woman of God. I am so elated this afternoon that we are able to share with her as she presents her book to the world. We see this in her co-authoring of not just this particular book, but 11 textbooks for both the primary and the secondary levels. She's also authored several articles on improving teaching pedagogy and augmenting curriculum design. And we are here to celebrate with her this, her first higher education text, English language teaching in post-method paradigm. What would be this celebration if we didn't anchor everything in a moment of inspiration? And on that note, to guide us through our first inspirational item, I would like to throw over to Mrs. Keisha Smith Davis, lecturer from the Department of Languages and Literatures at the Churches Teachers College. Mrs. Keisha Smith Davis. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Deuteronomy 8, 18 states, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, as it is today. This word was shared by Moses as he prepared the Israelites for their transition into the promised land. This transition would mark a new beginning for the Israelites, and he was outlining some core principles that he did not want them to forget. The verse begins with a call to remember. There are some things that we must forget in our journey to success. And there are some things that we must always remember. What should we remember? Firstly, remember the Lord and his faithfulness. Writing this book was not an overnight process. There were challenges, but in these challenges, God proved himself faithful, turning seemingly impossible tasks into possibilities. Why should we remember? It is he who gives the ability to produce wealth. And wealth here is also representative general, generally of success. He has endowed each of us with abilities with significance. And when we are successful, it is a result of his investments in us. We are reaping a harvest from the talents that he has blessed us with. So how do we demonstrate that we remember him? We can do this in two ways. Firstly, give thanks. First Thessalonians 5, 18 states, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Gratitude is one way in which we honor God for his guidance and blessings on our endeavors. It also demonstrates that we have not forgotten the blessings that he has given us. Secondly, how do we demonstrate that we remember him? Give back. Give of yourself. Recognize the others who have been a part of this journey to success. Mentor others. When you have been given a mission and it has been accomplished, share from that which you have gained on this journey. Give back of the knowledge that you have gained. Mentor others that they too may accomplish their greatest goals and desires. This book and the publication of this book is one way in which the authors and writers are giving back to others and are empowering others through their own research. So as we are about to begin this launch, I just want to quickly say a word of prayer. 
Lord God Almighty, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. And Lord, as we begin this launch, we want to thank you for all that you have done. Lord, you see all the hard work that was poured into the writing of the book and even now into the preparation of, for this launch, oh God. And Lord God Almighty, I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that you will bless this endeavor, God, that you will bring great prosperity, that there will be great success as this book goes forth. And I pray, oh God Almighty, that you will show all who have invested in this, oh God, great and mighty things that they knoweth not of, oh God. And Lord, we look forward to the great work that you will continue to do in their lives and through this mighty book. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Mentor others, give back. When you have a vision that's great, too great for just you, it calls for collaboration. And this book, is the epitome of scholarly collaboration where persons are willing to mentor and others and give back in writing, sharing their knowledge with others. Dr. Yoande Lewis Focom, lecturer from the Literacy Studies here in the School of Education at the University of the West Indies, Mona, will be doing the welcome and recognition. This pre-recording will be followed immediately by greetings from Dr. Garth Anderson, Dean of the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica and Principal of the Churches Teachers College here in Jamaica. Following his pre-recording, we'll have another greeting from our very own Dr. Marcia Rainford, Director of the School of Education here at the University of the West Indies. Their addresses will go in that order. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, and even good night for those listening and viewing at the book launch of Dr. Paulette Ferrario. English language teaching in a post method paradigm. This is indeed an international book with contributors all over the globe. Dr. Ferreria would like to acknowledge, thank, and recognize each person who contributed a chapter to this book. So, for those who are outside the Caribbean, or authors who are outside the Caribbean, Dr. Ferraria would like to recognize Asma Mwafa from the British University in Dubai, Helda Martins from Lisbon Polytechnic Institute in Portugal, Lorena Mihaes from the University of Bucharest in Romania, as well as Anda Dimitriou, also from the University of Bucharest, as well as Ana Maria Pinto Lorente from the University of Salamanca in Spain. Also contributors to this book are our own youth graduates within the announcement within the diaspora. So Miri McKee McDonald, who is now at the Emirates National School in the United Emirates, as well as Natalie Harvey, who is teaching at Beijing International School in China, as well as Cade Ferraria, who is at the Carrot Global Incorporated in Seoul, South Korea, as well as Paula Ferraria Davis, who's teaching at Cesar Chavez Public Policy Charter School, Washington, D.C., as well as Shimoy Masters, who is at Warren County High School in Georgia, USA. We also have contributors who are our own graduate student researchers from the University of the West Indies Amona campus. And these are from the graduating class of 2020. Congratulations. So first, we'd like to recognize Georgette Delavante, who's teaching at one of the higher education institutes here in Jamaica, as well as Yoni Donald, who's teaching at Enid Bennett High School, St. Catherine. Nevita Roberts, who is teaching at Karen Hall High School in St. Mary, 
And finally, we'd like to thank Nika Gaynor, who is also teaching. These are all graduates from the Masters of Education in Language Education from Mona Campus. We'd also like to thank our UE graduates who are now at the teachers' colleges, either teaching or doing administration. We have here Dr. Anne-Marie Wilmot, who is at the Church Teachers College. We'd like to also recognize our Dean Reed Virtue, who is also at Church Teachers College, as well as Tracy Ann Beckford, and she is at Shortwood Teachers College, and now a member of the Department of Language and Linguistics, Mona Campus. And finally, we'd like to thank our colleague, Dr. Janice Jules, who is from the Department of Language and Linguistics at Cave Hill Campus Barbados. Dr. Paulette Ferreira would love, and by calling out these names, to, to thank each one of you for your contribution to the book, English Language Teaching in a Post-Method Paradigm. Thank you. Dr. Paulette Ferreira, author, co-authors, educators, researchers, contributors, other distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to greet you in my capacities as principal of Church Teachers College Mandeville and Dean of the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica. There has been a concerted effort in our colleges to push the research agenda as an important pillar in teaching and the training of teachers to become more clinical in their efforts to help their students. And so one can imagine how important and pleasing it is to participate in this epic function on the occasion of the launch of this book that involves faculty members from Church Teachers College Mandeville, Shortwood Teachers College, as well as other educators who are putting on display their scholastic competences to the world that will redound not only to their benefit, but indeed the field of education. I want to publicly commend these lecturers who despite their heavy workload, the challenges and changes occasioned by COVID-19 found the time to expand their knowledge and to contribute to the educational development on the world stage. Special commendation must be extended to Dr. Paulette Ferreira, who has been a mentor, supporter, coach, and educator of notable repute for the tremendous work that she has been doing with these young researchers and writers in the field of teacher education. History will recall today's activity as part of a game-changing effort in teacher education for decades to come. The publisher's work must be celebrated and that we are doing this afternoon. But equally, we want them to see this function as a watershed moment and a solid foundation on which they must continue to build. Congratulations to you all as we continue to unite and serve. A very special good afternoon to all of those persons listening on News Talk FM and those participating via the Faculty of Humanities and Education's YouTube channel. This afternoon, I am very pleased to be associated with this event in which I am to bring greetings on behalf of the School of Education, the WMOA. Paulette joined the staff of the School of Education in 1999 and she was then lecturer um, in language education and is now senior lecturer. I have known Paulette for a number of years and it is true to say that she is a career educator. She has spent over 40 years in the field of education in this country, serving at the secondary and tertiary levels. She also served in the Ministry of Education as an education officer um, in the textbook writing program. And she has served at the regional level 
as an examiner for CSEC English. I know her to be an exciting and creative teacher of English, and I think that is well known by her students. It is also well known that she has an interest in the use of radio as a tool for teaching, and that may be one reason why we are gathered in this fashion for this very important book launch. I wish to acknowledge her service on behalf of the School of Education in the fact that in the way in which she has served as an educator. I wish to acknowledge that she has served the, the region. She has textbooks in English language targeting learners at the secondary system. But today we are here to congratulate her as she has moved to another level which is producing work for the tertiary level. And so we want to congratulate her on this very important achievement of this edited volume on English language teaching in a postmodern paradigm. I am no language educator, but I understand that one feature of this book is that it addresses a shift from the traditional, if one might look at it like that, look at the teaching of English, for example, English as a second language or English as a foreign language, and has embraced other methods, which shows a shift to a pedagogy, which is an immersion in English or sustained use of English in speech environments, especially those environments, those contexts where other languages challenge English in use as English teachers are being prepared. This work therefore posits that there is an opportunity to advance the scholarship of a post-method English language teaching paradigm from international and Caribbean perspectives to build a distinct indigenous pedagogy for English language teaching in the Caribbean and other global teaching learning contexts. This is a very bold step and I might add a very timely one in the preparation of teachers of English. I wish to highlight as well two important ways in which I think this work um, addresses what we do in the School of Education. Firstly, I want to speak to the collaborative effort. And this area is significant as Paulette collaborated um, with colleagues from various countries and with colleagues from our local teachers' colleges. And by so doing, she has aligned this work, the strategic direction of the School of Education to help to build capacity with other colleagues from the teacher training institutions and so strengthen teacher professional development. So Paul, if you want to thank you for not just looking inwards, but also looking outwards and providing opportunities for other practitioners to share their experiences and research. The second area in which I want to congratulate Paulette is this business of being a mentor teacher. And here, Paulette has demonstrated what is meant by just that, being a mentor teacher, by working with several of her students who themselves have written chapters in this book. This is significant um, because it not only builds capacity of the next generation of English language and English literature educators, but it also shows, again, the alignment with the School of Education's strategic plan to enable such collaboration with students and lecturers and to strengthen the research output of the school. So this work does not only feature international writers, as I have, as I have said, but these are, um, these, their work is in the same volume as work, the, the work of students, our students from the School of Education. Some of those students are about to graduate and some of them are recent graduates of the school. And from that perspective, Paulette, we are very grateful that you have managed to pull this together. So Paulette, as your colleague, I wish to commend you for this work, one that I am sure will be of great value, not just to our students in the school, but also to students from other teacher training institutions in Jamaica, the Caribbean and the world. I want to congratulate you on this book launch. I wish you every success and 
I wish you all the very best as you continue along the journey. What good call it. All the very best. Thank you so much to Dr. Bocum, who did our welcome and recognition. Dr. Garth Anderson for our greeting. Dr. Marcia Rainford, who we just heard from. And of course, at this time, I would like to invite to the lectern, Professor Minerva Sain, who is currently the Director of Graduate Studies and Research here at the University of the West Indies. She joined the staff of the University of the West Indies in 1992 as a research fellow at the Tropical Metabolism Research Unit and has served the University of the West Indies in capacities as an associate lecturer, as well as consultant pediatrician at the University Hospital of the West Indies. Again, it is with great pleasure that I invite to the lectern Professor Minerva Thane to provide us with her greeting. Thank you very much. Masters of Ceremony, Mrs. Jones, Dr. Maurice Smith, University Registrar, the University of the West Indies, Dr. Marcia Rainford, Director, School of Education, Mona, Dr. Garth Anderson, Dean, Teachers Colleges of Jamaica, Dr. Louis Fokum, Lecturer, Literacy Studies, School of Education at Mona, Dr. Paulette Ferraria, Senior Lecturer, School of Education at Mona, and all her collaborators, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good night, good morning, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world. First, let me thank the organizers of this book launch to invite me to bring greetings from the Office of Graduate Studies and Research and to be part of a launch of what I see as an exciting book. The Office of Graduate Studies and Research is always pleased to see events of this nature and fully support and endorse them. The book has been produced by several collaborators from various parts of the world. This concept of multi-collaboration to produce a final product is not a foreign one to me, as I originally hailed from the Faculty of Medical Sciences, where it is a norm for our colleagues to engage in collaborative work. It has always been recognized by persons in the Faculty of Medical Sciences that one person often does not have the skills necessary to produce the high quality work that will allow publications and be accepted in high citing journals. So the experts in the field will work together with their biostatisticians to ensure that the quality and analysis is first class. However, I was informed very early on in my career by a dean of humanities that this idea of collaboration is not practiced in the Faculty of Humanities and Education. And I was quite slapped down for it when I suggested that this was something that could be done. So the production of this book, however, has used this model of receiving contributions from a wide collection of people to produce a fantastic publication, which we celebrate and launch today. And I must congratulate Dr. Ferreria and her team for this successful venture. The vision to seek collaboration from various persons with different skill sets and from different countries bringing their culture and different perspectives has made this publication strong and rich. The book has highlighted topics like curriculum, pedagogy, and teacher's education, which makes it ideal for professionals, researchers, policymakers, academics, and educators. The publication encourages teachers to think outside of the box and to become more innovative to share their cultural diversity, and to seek more information to widen their horizon through language. Areas in this book focuses on the issues related to grammar, grammar instruction, techniques, and strategies used in teacher's talk, student's talk, through grammar explanation. 
Some persons have always suggested that English be taught as a foreign language in Jamaica. And this discussion seems to continue. And this too, this book has covered. The pros and cons of text messaging and the impact on the forum of students writing has been examined with very interesting results. The book speaks to smartphones, integrating e-learning in the teaching of English language classes. The book covers such a wide range of experiences. The Office of Graduate Studies and Research would like to congratulate Dr. Ferraria and her team and her numerous collaborators for this exciting production here this morning, afternoon, night, <laughs> and more. We wish you a very successful launch, and I look forward to more of this type of collaborative work. Thank you very much. Well, following on the trend that has been set, good morning, good afternoon, good night. I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to everyone who's listening on Newstalk 93 FM through the program, The Radioactive Classroom, another other brainchild, um, brain children of Dr. Ferreira. And you know what? If you have never listened into that program, I don't know what you're doing on a Sunday afternoon. You really need to. If you are a teacher that's sitting in your classroom and you're trying to figure out how do I get these children to learn English? How do I get them excited about this language without them being intimidated, without them losing their passion for sharing their ideas? You may want to purchase a copy of this book. It has been mentioned by our previous speakers, the collaborative effort that has gone into this publication. And we have several of those authors of the different chapters who will be commenting on the process as we go on this afternoon. We do have with us Dr. Maurice Smith, who is our keynote speaker this afternoon. And I met Dr. Smith a few years ago, and if I remember nothing else, he delivers truth clearly, succinctly, and he speaks life and progress into all who he meets. But at this time, it is with pleasure that I welcome Dr. Aisha Spencer, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education and a Senior Lecturer in the Faculty of Education. Now, if you have never met Dr. Spencer, she has been teaching language and literature for approximately 22 years. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. When you see her, you will understand that unless she started teaching it when she was four, from the perspective of, again, someone immersed in the language. But yes, I think teaching keeps us young. Yes? Of course. So she is not just an educator at the tertiary level, but she does understand what really goes into the teaching of language and literature. And she is the recipient of the University of the West Indies Guardian Life Award for Excellence in Teaching, and that she received in November of 2018. She will provide us with an introduction to this afternoon's keynote speaker. Help me make welcome from wherever you are in the world, wherever you may be in your home. Dr. Aisha Spencer, as she introduces this afternoon's keynote speaker. Thank you very much. I'm going to start by saying good whatever time of day it is to everyone. Um, all protocols observed. I want to congratulate Dr. Paulette Ferreira and her contributors on really what is a very profound and established moment in the history of language education. At this time, I have the pleasure of introducing to you our keynote speaker for today's special event, our university registrar, Dr. Maurice D. Smith. An established educator, Dr. Maurice Smith began his journey in the field of education by receiving professional training at the Michael University College in Kingston, Jamaica. He then went on to earn his undergraduate and graduate degrees with honors from both Northern Caribbean University and the Nova Southeastern University, respectively, 
and in 2010 was awarded a Fulbright scholarship through which he earned the title of Doctor of Education with high commendation in educational leadership and policy from Howard University. Dr. Smith's academic success in the field of education then charted the way for his meaningful participation in and contribution to the education sector in Jamaica. He has functioned in various capacities across our education system, serving as counselor, deputy principal, principal, education officer, team leader of the education transformation team in the Ministry of Education. Dr. Smith is credited with the establishment also of Belmont Academy, Jamaica's first center of excellence. At the end of his tenure as principal director of the National College for Educational Leadership, he was then in 2015 appointed permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information. In 2016, as a result of his remarkable contribution to the fields of education in Jamaica, Dr. Smith was awarded the Prime Minister's Medal of Appreciation for Service to Education. Since 2017, Dr. Smith has been engaged as an international educational consultant to the World Bank, UNESCO, and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, where he provides policy and technical advice to governments across Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Middle East. In June 2019, based on his exceptional service to Jamaica, Dr. Smith received the Governor General's Achievement Award. Dr. Smith continues to light the torch through his dedication and commitment to education locally, regionally, and internationally. Here at the UWI in his capacity as University Registrar, he is considered the Chief Administrative Officer having responsibility for the regional administrative operations of our five campuses, which spans over 17 countries. Additionally, as a certified performance coach and Commonwealth professional fellow in education, Dr. Smith continues to address local and international conferences on matters related to educational leadership. He is also an author, a motivational speaker, and justice of the peace for the parish of Kingston. Ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome to the podium this afternoon, our keynote speaker, Dr. Marie. Thank you very much, Dr. Spencer. A Master of Ceremonies, uh, Professor Thames, our distinguished author and co-authors here present. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all good afternoon. I, I have to be particularly careful, cautious, if, 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 if not, because I'm, I'm among teachers of English. <laughs> and so my language has got to be right. So I crave your indulgence. I crave your indulgence. Mine is a task today to share with you my own thoughts concerning the text that has been written and the text that, that's before us today. I engaged in deep reflection exactly about what it is that I would share, uh, giving allegiance to the fact that I'm related to Dr. Ferreira in a number of ways and over a number of years. I, I thought about the role of the language, not only in a historical context, but also in a contemporary sense, how do we use the language to position ourselves uh, to ensure that there is relevance and currency, not only as an institution, but also as a people. The, the, the book, and it's not my task to, 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 to divulge too much of the book, I mean, purchase the book, <laughs> <laughs> but the book, provides a rich kaleidoscope of cultural, academic, and professional experiences about the teaching and learning of, of English language. I think about my own teachers of, of, of language who, when I was a little boy growing up, I really thought that they were gods. I, whenever I talk about this subject, I give uh, kudos a reverence, if you will, to my teachers. I, I, I didn't know they were human. I was required to get to school at 7.30, even though classes would begin at 
And when I got there on 7.30, there were 100 statements on the board. I don't know what time they made it to the board, but I thought my teachers were particularly cruel because we were required to get there ahead of time. And when we got there, we had all this work on the board. And then before we were engaged in, in interacting with those statements, we were required to exchange the, 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 the books, the, the homework that we had gotten the evening before, and that's another 300. And I noted from very early that the teachers did themselves mark the work. They told us to exchange the books. So I thought that was adding insult to injury. One of the things I remember well about my teachers of English is that they, we couldn't just proffer an answer. We couldn't just say this is the, the correct answer. We had to know the rules of engagement. We had to be able to conjugate. We had to be able to reason. We had to be able to rationalize. We had to be able to explain and defend an answer. And if it is that the answer were correct, but the explanation is wrong, it wouldn't be credited. Little did I know at the time that uh, those, that was uh, the, the way our teachers ensured that we understood the rudiments of the language. And uh, I am particularly troubled, and I'll share, I'll, I'll share why. Uh, we have now a system, not only in Jamaica, but right across the region, uh, where we diagnose the developmental needs and the language abilities and proficiencies of our students who enter primary school. That's done when they're six years old in grade one. It's, in fact, it's done before. It's done again, and it varies between grades two and grade, grades two and three, depending on what country you're in. There is an international benchmark, age 10, when they get to grade four. And then it, uh, there is a terminal point where another diagnosis is taken, is made at the end of grade six as they transition from one rung of the ladder to the other. Almost invariably, uh, about 60% of our, our, our kids are, are identified as having appropriately developed the competences of the language as they make that transition. Interestingly, by the time they get to the end of their secondary sojourn, when they shall have sat CSIC exams. When we reflect upon the statistical analyses, we, we note that again, similarly, only two or three children uh, arrive, are, are located in, in that medium that says that they, have, they, they, they are somewhat comfortable with the language. Then we have a, a, a smaller number of kids who, who migrate onwards to tertiary education. And not only as a regional body, but also across the road, the University of Technology, they would have in the last decade or so introduced a proficiency test. And the question is asked, but if it is that the students do so well at CXC, I mean, they get grades three and or two or two, why then what's the rationale for their sitting uh, this proficiency exam? They go through our programs and they graduate. And this is, the this is the time for graduation. In fact, as I made my way here, I listened to the ceremony from NCU. And I, I, I thought to myself that we as, as institutions, as, as vanguards of the language, our students go through our courses and go through our programs. Many of them, they graduate with first class honors, upper second class, et cetera, et cetera. But when we review their work, then we identify that there are particular deficits in the use of the language. I then ask myself the question, to what extent has the institutional framework uh, incubated or nurtured appropriately the requisite skills and competencies as far as the language is concerned. The book then gains additional relevance because as I glanced through and, 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 and my air, my eyes were locked on particular articles, some of which uh, resonated with me, and I think I will allude to um, shortly from now. The, 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 there is an, 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 an academic uh, explanation, a dissecting, if you will, of, of lived experiences that help to give insights that I think not, don't only have professional relevance, but also have significant policy implications. I then thought that I would share with you briefly my own thoughts 
um, from the theme interactive instruction, which is which is paradoxical in nature, because from my own um, orientation as a behavioral scientist, there can be no instruction outside of interaction. It's almost a, a, a it's almost a redundancy. But 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 I do so for for for, for emphasis. And I wish to, with the author's permission, um, overlay uh, my own or share with you an overlay of my own thoughts, having read the book and being able to align my synopsis of the, 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 the experiences shared by the author and her co-authors with those gained through my own years as a practitioner. The first thought that I wish to deposit is that of constructing pedagogy constructing pedagogy, that as teachers of the language, we very often uh, lose ourselves in the, 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 this, this, this narrative, this construct, uh, this, 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 this foolishness, this fallacy called a, a, a curriculum that very many of us enter the classrooms wanting to teach the curriculum, not understanding that the curriculum is only a guide and we don't teach the curriculum, we actually teach the student who must interact with the curriculum. I, I, I learned from early the difference between language and literature. And when we walk into our, our classrooms in, 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 our, in our public and, and private institutions, that there is this interaction with content. And the content is good. But there are particular domains that, that, that transcend whether it is, it is math or language or, or science or whatever the discipline is. That if we're going to develop uh, the rudiments, the, the, the rules of engagement or the rules of grammar, if we're going to understand and, and appreciate the beauty and the utility of the language. There are four simple things that every class must, 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 must consider. We must teach our people how to listen. That's not a skill that competence that ought to be taken lightly because it doesn't matter who we are or what role we play, the art of listening is a critical component for alas, if an individual is unable to speak physiologically, the first place that our colleagues and Professor Thames will, will correct me if I'm wrong, is they check is their hearing. Are they hearing right? Is their hearing intact? And I wish I wanted to suggest to us colleagues that, that whether we are presidents of developed countries or whether we are university registrars or whether we are lecturers or whether we sweep, we sweep the streets, there is an advantage to the art of listening. And if we're going to develop the language, we must teach our students how to listen. We must teach our students how to speak. That when they assume even a, 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 a position, even they're chatting nonsense, even if there, there, is, there is no substance, if they deliver that no substance with confidence, then they shall have won the game even before they begin to speak. That we must teach our people how to, how, how to defend their positions, how, 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 how to not lay meek or appear to be meek, but how to articulate themselves and express themselves because there is a utility, there is an advantage, there is a benefit to be gained by saying what you think. We must encourage our people how to speak because as a people, we have historically taught our kids not to express themselves, not to say what it is that they ought to say. And, and there's a gender divide in the book. The book addresses those issues because we, we, we accept the notion that a female speak much. I, I could qualify that, but I, 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 I shall not. <laughs> and, and we also accept the notion that I may not know to speak well, if it is that men ought not to speak, with whom are the women going to be communicating? With whom are they going to be conversing? We ought to teach our people how to listen. We ought to teach our people how to speak. We ought to teach our people how to read. I always saw my teachers with the star and wondered, wondered why would my middle class teachers be associating themselves with the trash? and the nonsense that's reflected in those. I, I always wondered that as a little boy until I was able to deduce my own conclusion that as a, as a reader, as someone who, who is immersed in the development of, of the language, it really doesn't matter what you read because you are able to sift through and arrive at your own conclusions. You may agree, you may disagree, you may, you may be ambivalent, you may have no opinion, but you are associating yourselves with it. And it is critical, colleagues, because in this dispensation, if you're not of the same religious hue, 
if you're not of the same creed and some color and social class, if you're not of the same political conviction, then we don't engage each other in dialogue. What nonsense is that? How, how do we sharpen our skill sets? How do we how do we become aware of what exists? How do we appreciate our own stance if at all we don't engage and interact with other bits of information? So we must listen, we must read, we must speak, we must write. We must, we, we must teach, uh, uh, and I'm going to say this, and it may be controversial, we, may we must teach our teachers how to write. We must teach our students how to write, that there is a, there's an art, there, there's a formulaic approach to constructing a, a, a piece, whether it's an article, an op-ed, a letter, there's, a, there's an art to writing. I have gotten to the place now where I have stopped uh, correcting people's work. I've said to them, okay, you know, if, it, if I affix my signature, it's good. If my signature is not affixed, it's an indication that there are some deficits with the piece. Reflect upon it. Because my signature is, an, is a representation of my own standards. And if our colleagues, if our students, if our supervisors, whoever it is, if it is that their, 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 output, their product is out of a particular standard, we should so indicate, because if we don't, they won't grow. So our pedagogy as teachers of the language is critical. So we must construct that pedagogy, but secondly, we must craft our practice. That none of us leaves university. And as great as the School of Education is, and I, I greet um, Dr. Renford, as great as the School of Education is, that our students don't leave here uh, becoming their, their best selves. And this thing is about, uh, it's a process. It, 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 it's, it's a trajectory. It, 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 it's our growing and developing. It's our becoming better. It's our crafting our strategies. And, and it's, our, it's our learning how to do this thing called English. You know, when our students are with us, whether they come from, well, let me not name names, whether they come from hither or thither, here or there. <laughs> and it is not unique to Jamaica that whilst they go through our courses, whether at college or at university, why they, whilst they go through our programs, that they understand that there is a methodology that, that, that has to be engaged, that that methodology is refined, that that methodology is not static, because the methodology changes as they change, as they grow, as they develop, they must craft their practice. That teaching practice ought not to be something that is confined to, to, to an, an academic scholastic program, but their teaching practice ought to be the norm. And when we walk into our classrooms of, of English, we see textbooks and we see handouts. I was so moved, I was so impressed when I read the article on text messaging how to use technology, how to bring the students' lived experiences into the classroom, how to make it relevant, how to make it dynamic so that students aren't bored. Students say, oh my God, you know, English again, because historically when we think of teachers of English, we think of older, more mature people who are far removed from the realities of the students. That's how our students think and perceive our teachers of English. But when they think about English class, they must be running because they, 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 there must be an, an excitement, there must be an engagement, there must be this novelty and this innovative approach that's taken to the teaching and learning of the language. We must institutionalize our best practices. We, we, we should embrace the, the, uh, the, the, the scholarship of teaching and learning. We should look at action research. Were we to do this in our classroom, what would be the result? Our classrooms, our practice must be filled with novelty and innovation. It must be an exciting place, not just a place where we, we flip the pages of a book, but we can connect that which is on the pages of, of that book to us in the pages of the slides that our students live each day. So they see themselves in the character. So they're able to make a connection between language and literature because in our Jamaican classrooms, those two things are seen as being discreet and they really are not. They really are not. So whilst we construct our pedagogy, we must craft our practice and finally we must confirm our philosophy. We must confirm our philosophy. I, I, uh, Madam Master of Ceremonies, when introducing um, our Deputy D, you made reference to, you know, I, I get in trouble for the fact that I, I speak my mind. But I am 44. I can handle it. I can handle it. I, 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 I I'm not entirely sure 
we can be so loose and lax with those who we call student teachers, uh, those who come to us and then we unleash upon the society as teachers of English. Because in my own limited um, interactions, I have come to discover that many of those who teach English don't know English. And you can't deliver to students that which you don't have. You can't give that which you don't possess. We, 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 should, sh shall we do away with the CXC English as a rhetorical question? Shall we revisit our, 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 our curriculum, curricula at the, the teacher's college or at the university level? Ought we to focus more on the learning of the language as opposed to the teaching of the language? What is the connection? Well, is there one? And if there is one, what is the connection between policy and practice? Why do we have this great academic work con contained on the page of this text? But yet our departments and our ministries of education across the region, when they examine um, um, student performance, they have interventions for students forgetting that it is the same teacher that's leading the intervention. And if they didn't have it right in the first instance, what makes us think they will have it right in the second or third instance? That is, it, or there, is, it, is this not the time for there to be an intervention of the teachers themselves? It's, it's interesting. But we should get to the place where as we write, as we read, as we speak, where whenever there is an error, if at all there is one there, an amber light ought to go off because we're so, we so trained, we are so, we are so immersed and our, our language abilities are, are so on point that we can detect an, an, an error even if it is read from uh, the pages of our leaders. We should, we should be able to detect an error even if the speaker speaks with an accent because we, we believe that once people speak in, with an accent that's different from ours that you're speaking English and that's not so. But we can't know any better unless we know better. So we should confirm our philosophy. So as I reflect upon the text, 15 chapters, um, European, Asian, North American, Caribbean writers sharing um, their own um, academic and professional cultural experiences with respect to the teaching and learning of the language. I thought it was a great read. I, I thought it has uh, far reaching implications for how we shape um, our language curricula, how we identify who our teachers of language are, how do we flip the script in our classrooms of English language? How do we ensure all teachers to understand that irrespective of the, teach, the discipline that you are from, you are really teaching the language? I don't get drawn to this, well, let me behave myself. I don't get drawn to this narrative. I was going to use an adjective. I, I don't get drawn to this narrative about whether or not you know, we should uh, part company with the English language and teach in our Jamaican classrooms. Um, Patwa. I'm not saying yay or nay. What my only observation is this, that those who, who are proponents of that discipline uh, are steeped in both disciplines. That's all I will say about that for now. What I shall end by saying, the text is a great write. It's a, it's, it's a great read. I commend it to all and hope that you will interact with it because therein on those pages, our nuggets that all of us in our professional and our personal spaces will find helpful. Congratulations all. Being where you are, you may not be able to give the round of applause for Dr. Smith to hear, so let me do that for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. The teaching of English should be anchored in the teaching of listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills. And as educators, we should endeavor to construct our pedagogy, craft our practice, and confirm our philosophy. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States said, if given five hours to cut down a tree, he would spend the first four hours sharpening his ax. As we go about this business of endeavoring to teach, whether it is in a formal setting as a teacher, whether of English or any other subject, or whether it is that we teach through our interactions with people, 
let us endeavor to sharpen our acts so that we can be more effective. And that is one of the key things that this particular book affords us an opportunity to do. It is to sharpen your acts, your skills as an educator. Dr. Ferreira did not compile this book completely on her own because where it is that the vision of change is great, collaboration becomes necessary. And so let us hear at this time reflections from contributors. And we are very pleased to have several of the co-authors with us joining us. Special welcome again to our listeners on News Talk 93 FM and those persons who are streaming live through YouTube or joining us through Zoom. Mrs. Paulette Ferreira Davis. And yes, you know that funny name, you know there's some association, right? Yes, so Mrs. Paula Ferreira Davis is not only an accomplished educator in the area of English language and literature in her own right, she is the daughter of Dr. Ferreira. And they always say, of course, you teach starting at home. And the passion is obviously so infectious that many of her own children, both by birth and those who she has touched in her life as an educator, have all been steeped in this passion for the teaching of English. Mrs. Davis is a teacher of English and an instructional coach at the Cesar Chavez Public Charter School in the United States. And let us welcome her as she shares her own reflections on her journey as a co-author of this amazing text. Mrs. Paula Ferreira Davis. Thank you, Mrs. Jones. Um, I guess I should follow suit. Good morning, good afternoon, good night to all our listeners out there. Um, I just wanna take a brief moment just to share my brief reflections on my chapter. Um, the title of my chapter is A Room of My Own, The Jamaican Corner in a Virginian Classroom. I came up with that title based on the experience I was having as a Jamaican teacher teaching for the first time in the United States. Um, not only was I faced with a new culture, but I was faced with students who were English language learners. I realized that they were hesitant to engage with me because I was not a Spanish speaker. So it made me seem somewhat unrelatable or even out of place. Um, this is where the idea of that sense of space came into play. Uh, establishing a sense of space is important when trying to engage learners, especially if they're from varying cultural backgrounds as they need as they all need to feel that they belong. Um, when I think about the significance of my chapter as it relates to like this international arena, um, I really believe that educators around the globe need to ensure that they're in their practice, they're always thinking about whether or not their students feel a sense of belonging in their classrooms and in the whole learning process altogether. Uh, learning, I think learning takes roots when students can see how it applies to them and how it belongs to them. Um, I think a lot of educators think, you know, I'm the teacher, this is what I have to give you and you should take it. But if students cannot relate, if they're not comfortable, then they're not going to take in what you're putting out. Um, and so this is why it, it has become very important to me, especially as a teacher of English, that all, all students, even English language learner from a different culture, even our Jamaican students, should be able to see themselves in the books that they read as this makes learning more engaging for them and it pushes students to take more ownership of the discussions that they have in their classrooms. And thus, the end result will be that their classrooms will become a room of their own. Thank you so much. You should ensure that the children are able to see themselves in the books that they read and that will promote engagement. One of many of the nuggets that's contained in chapter two, the Jamaican corner in a Virginian classroom, constructing an ESL place-based pedagogy. At this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Janice Jules, 
author of chapter five in the book. And the chapter that Dr. Jules will be reflecting on will be from teacher talk to student talk. I'm very curious about that one, particularly as a school principal, because here it is that she's talking about not just from teacher talk to student talk, but repositioning learners for success in the language classroom. Let's be very attentive and keen as we observe Dr. Jules her and her reflection on her chapter, chapter five. Let's pay keen attention. Good afternoon, everyone. And I am really happy for the opportunity to be a part of this um, event. I first want to take the opportunity to congratulate my colleague, Dr. Fiera, on this fantastic publication. I also want to thank her sincerely for the opportunity she gave me to contribute to this book. And the truth is that I really love writing this chapter um, from teacher talk to student talk, repositioning learners for um, success in the language classroom. And I felt an intense passion as I, I, I wrote this chapter because it was a way not only to, to express what happens in the classroom, in our um, the Caribbean, in our language classroom, but it, it was a way to document for others to be aware that the Caribbean region is truly a complex location to language. And even that, however, even with these complexities, what happens here in our classrooms with language instruction in relation to culture and cultural traditions is really no different from what occurs in other places uh, of the world. So this focus on the importance of student, student talk within the post-method um, environment is crucial, you know, for our students' success. And I got the opportunity to write about it. So it's very humbling to know that through the, the, the text, English language teaching in the post-method paradigm, that I was able to make a contribution to, to um, inform, to give information which can be helpful within a uh, international arena. So I want to, Again, thank everyone for the opportunity to be involved in this um, event. And I particularly again want to thank my colleague, um, Paulette, for the opportunity and for allowing me to have a voice. So thank you very much. And I wish you continued success. And of course, thanks to the School of Education for this opportunity. Thank you. or contributing your own thoughts and your own experiences. It helped to make the text so much richer. Of course, there are many other chapters and we're very grateful at this time to have the presence of Mrs. Noree McLean McDonald, who co-authored chapter one, Teacher Constructed Theories for a Post-Method Paradigm. She's joining us all the way from the other side of the globe. And isn't that the beauty about technology? Dr. Ferrer, I think you're onto something. Um, I'm a little late in catching up because she's been saying this for years. Utilize the technology to teach language and find out of the box ways of doing it. And as such, she invited Mrs. Noree McLean McDonald, who co-authored chapter one, and I am excited to hear about your reflection on this journey to contribute your own thoughts. Help me welcome Mrs. McLean McDonald. Okay, greetings everyone. Um, first, let me start by saying that Jamaican educators are taking the world by storm. And by this, I mean that we're everywhere in international classrooms across the globe. And of course, quite a number of UWI uh, students from the, the School of Education are currently teaching, well, graduates are currently teaching in big cities and small towns and quaint villages of neighboring countries and faraway places. Uh, they take with them a toolkit, which includes the pedagogy and habits of practice to which they have become accustomed in their home country. For many, 
relatable concepts and strategies are immediately challenged in their new environments. So in short, things are simply put done differently. Even familiar pedagogy takes on a new perspective. So most of us, to most of it, 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 it quickly becomes clear that the culture, politics, and social norms of the teacher's host country drive instructional style and even subject content. Uh, a huge part of cultural expression is language, and therefore the English language arts teacher in navigating the curriculum must consider the student's English language context in contrast to her own. In order to succeed, she must be willing to adopt new language teaching methodologies, adapt old ones, and reconcile the two. For an international English language teacher, this becomes a necessary process each time she moves to a new country. For me and my co-contributor, Natalie Harvey, conducting research to compose the chapter, Teacher Constructed Theories for a Post-Method Paradigm, provided us with motivation to reflect on our practice as international language arts teachers. It also gave validity to certain steps we had to take to construct intuitive pedagogy in order to ensure our success in a new language teaching context. We would like to thank Dr. Ferreira for providing us with the opportunity to participate in this very relevant and timely discourse. We are confident that this publication makes for a valuable resource for language education students at home and abroad. And I do say abroad because English language educators, from my experience, hail from diverse backgrounds and must be prepared for success in a dynamic instructional area where cultures often collide. As such, the book English Language Teaching in a Post-Method Paradigm is truly significant to the study of English language instruction internationally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Nuri McLean MacDonald, co-author of chapter one of the book, English Language Teaching in a Post-Method Paradigm. I was particularly pleased when you mentioned the shift in pedagogy, the shift in one's own thinking as you engage with children in different parts of the world. Again, respecting the cultural differences and the diversity of host countries and how we reconcile that with our own home countries and that of our students. The world is really shrinking. And as we move and we touch all the corners of the globe, we need to have a toolkit, again, remembering that if we can sharpen our practice, then we can do as so encouraged by our guest speaker to again ensure that our teaching practice becomes just that, a lifelong practice. At this time, we have an item by Miss Shanice White, teacher of English at the Monroe College in Jamaica. This is pre-recorded and will be followed by a number of reflections from UWI graduate students who have also co-authored sections of this amazing text, English Language Teaching in a Post-Method Paradigm. Following the item, we'll have the following presentations and they will go in this order. From Mrs. Yene O'Mealy Donald, teacher of English at the Enid Bennett High School here in St. Catherine, Jamaica. And she will have her presentation delivered by pre recording, followed by a reflection on the significance of collaborative research. Again, ensuring that we benefit from the collective wisdom, the opinions, and ideas of looking at a single thing from multiple perspectives. Ms. Navita Roberts, teacher of English from the Karen Hall High School in St. Mary, Jamaica, and Mrs. Georgette Delavente. Again, she holds a master's in higher education in management, and she is also a graduate of the University of the West Indies, Mona. So sit back, enjoy the item, and remember, we are keenly listening, one of those critical skills mentioned by Dr. Smith as we go through and hear 
from other UA alumni on their reflections on the text and the journey or item by Ms. Shanice White. So we're winning right now. So we're winning right now. Yeah, we're winners. So we're winning right now. Thanksgiving right now. So we're winning right now. So we're winners. Go on with it, go on with it. To us. So we are for me with a course. Blessings to the reaper with course in a hand. With a rise and boost. We give thanks that we need in the most. Yeah, we give thanks that we really support to be thankful. Blessings are for my life and we give thanks to the journey, the earnings, the dust to the plus. Gratitude is a must. Blessings are for my life and we thank God for the journey, the earnings, the dust to the plus. Gratitude is a must. Blessings. Good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with you. Now, the chapter for which I'll be providing an overview is entitled Post Method Pedagogy Empowering Educators to Meet the Multifaceted Challenges of Teaching English Language in Jamaica. Now, I'm sure that all of you would agree that the language environment in Jamaica is complex. For one thing, our language situation is yet to be defined and has been explored in a limited way. Two, we operate in a context where there are two dominant languages, the Jamaican Creole and the Jamaican Standard English. However, the two languages do not hold the same privileges as the Jamaican Creole is treated by some as a corrupt linguistic form and as inferior to the Jamaican Standard English. Third, compounding the situation is the fact that there is great diversity within the first language of the majority. And we know what that is, the Jamaican Creole, of course. Now, in view of the foregoing, two questions arise. What implications does Jamaica's language situation have for the teaching and learning of English? And how can teachers capitalize on Jamaica's language reality in catering to students' language learning? Now, we search for those answers, my co-author and I, and we search through the voices of 14 students from three schools and a teacher of English from a high school. Now, we unearth some interesting findings, but one outstanding finding was that the language politics shaped the perception of both teachers and students and impacted um, the teaching and learning of English language. Now, one of the things that we found was that teachers who had a negative perception of Jamaican Creole gave students the impression that they ought not to speak unless, unless such utterances were in standard English. This was found to influence limited participation as well as contributed to low self-esteem among students. This <laughs> led to lowered English language performance. In contrast, those who allowed the students to produce Jamaican Creole if they had a difficulty finding the English words and use what was produced to bridge as a bridge to develop English language competence caused their students to 
to be confident and willing to participate. And of course, there was a difference in the performance of these students for English. Now, based on our finding, we formulated several recommendations, but I'm just going to be sharing two with you today. One, teachers need to abandon the perception that one language is inferior to the other and instead get to know the lang how the language situation affects students' performance and develop strategies to respond to these findings. Finally, forums should be created to ensure that all teachers of English are sensitized and informed of the implications of their language attitudes and strategies, considering that there's a connection between this and the development of English language competence. So that is all from me today. Thank you and have a good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. The main significance of the experiences involved in completing our chapter to my co-author, Yane Donald, and me, is that it provided added value to our tenure as graduate students at the University of the West Indies. Naturally, we would have entered our program of study with the expectation that we would access content that would help us grow as practitioners in our field. We were able to access such. We also expected to engage in a major research project towards the end of our program of study. What we did not expect was to be a part of a groundbreaking project which focuses on a paradigm shift in English language teaching. This was a very rewarding experience. We were able to access the works of contributors to the field of English language teaching, such as those of Beverly Bryan and Dennis Craig through our core courses. We were also able to, through our own empirical study, engage in a solutions or possibilities oriented approach. So here we were, wearing the hats of practitioner, graduate student, and researcher. And through this, we were able to reflect on our practice, the theoretical and empirical works of significant contributors to the field of English language teaching, and our own findings gathered through our study. This experience, or this kind of reflection rather, provided an extra layer to the empowerment we received as graduate students. So, if I should sum up the significance or the benefits of our contributions to this work, I would use one phrase, and that phrase is added value. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is with, great, with a great sense of pride that I share my contribution to this groundbreaking work. My chapter focuses on the value of integrating elements of popular culture, that is text, music, film, television, social media, and other digital trends within the English language classroom. The research presented validated the perceptions that many students do in fact struggle with attaining the necessary competencies in the English language context. And this is for a myriad of reasons. One recurring theme is that they see it as being irrelevant to their everyday lives. Popular culture, on the other hand, represents the student's social currency of sorts, which they deem to be important and which they hold in high esteem. When educators in the student-centered classroom integrate popular culture in their delivery of the English language curriculum, the research presented suggests that there is a deeper understanding of the curriculum overall, as students are able to make thematic connections between the content being taught and their lived experiences. 
with this deepened understanding, a bridge is indeed formed between the English language classroom and the students' lived experiences through integrating popular culture. Now, as I reflect on the process of writing this chapter while being enrolled in a graduate program at the UWI, it was indeed challenging to create that balance between coursework commitments and the rigor of the peer review process. But I must say it was definitely worth it. I was able to implement many of the recommendations for the research within my teaching practice, and I have witnessed some of the positive highlights in this chapter. I thank Dr. Ferreira again for trusting me with this project, and I appreciate this awesome opportunity. Thank you very much. We have heard from Ms. Navita Roberts and her co-author, Mrs. Yane Donald, reflecting on the process of writing chapter 15, post-paradigm pedagogies empowering educators to meet multifaceted challenges of teaching English language in Jamaica. We have also heard from Mrs. Georgette Delevante, who authored chapter 12 of the text, and her chapter was entitled Popular Culture and English Language Teaching. And she reflected on popular culture providing a bridge and not a barrier in the acquisition of second language skills. Now, a text such as this that covers alternative media, digitalization, cross-cultural phenomena, linguistics, pedagogy, sustained use of English, and so many more areas, ideas of English language education has to be groundbreaking for a number of reasons. As you have heard, these were students who were balancing both the acquisition of knowledge, the reflection of its use, and then putting out information, again, contributing to the scholarship and scholarly work that's available to help all of us as we go about this business of teaching persons the language, English language. One of the key things that struck me as you come to the podium, Dr. Smith, was how persons were talking about where teachers value the language and the culture of the children, they actually learn more. Another thing that struck me as quite interesting is how, as a facilitator of learning, Dr. Ferreira provided an opportunity for her students to not only review the work of others, but she held them accountable for its use and not only the reflection on its use, but contributing to the body of work that's available in the field of education. You see, that's what great teachers do. They not only stretch us, but they hold us accountable for paying our blessings forward. I would like to, at this time, invite to the lectern Dr. Marie Smith, registrar here at the University of the West Indies, to reflect along with us and to highlight the significance of the work, not only um, to the UWI graduates themselves, but what about persons in the diaspora? Help me welcome Dr. Marie Smith to the virtual lectern. Thank you. You know, in 2016, as we oversaw the introduction of the new standards curriculum, I remember interacting with a group of uh, consultants that we had brought in from Singapore. And they made an observation which resonated. In fact, I still remember what it is that was said. Uh, they made the point that there in Singapore, they use technology as the medium through which their curricula are developed and delivered. And their criticism, their one criticism of the curriculum, our new curriculum at the time, was that there was no central theme, there was no vehicle through which uh, the, 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 the curricula could be cascaded. And I thought that that was remarkable. They went on to point out that we are so rich as a people in culture, but we weren't using culture to shape 
and, 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 and carve ideas and to present those ideas in a meaningful way. And I listened to many of the co-authors who spoke and I, I tried my best to allude to that, that it's not just teaching a document, but it's linking um, the concepts, the constructs to the culture, the real life experiences of the students of the communities in, in, in which they live. And so the significance of this work uh, of the, and of the UWI graduate is particularly important because it connects the wider world with our reality. So a few years ago, the first time I went to Kuala Lumpur, one of the things that I saw, there was this huge blow up of Usain Bolt um, in, in, in the airport. We aren't known for uh, these sorts of, 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 of scholastic attempts as far as English is concerned. And I believe that this is an entry to that, 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 that landscape. And as Nairi said um, earlier on, and she's so correct, that it is Jamaican teachers are everywhere. Jamaican teachers are everywhere. And we are not just everywhere, not just they are physically taking space where they are making an impact, having an effect. And so I believe that this is important because it, 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 it opens the eyes of the world to the fact that we have teachers of English language who are steeped, who are excellent in what they do, who are, who are uh, effective in what they do, who are shaping ideas, who are making their presence known and felt. It's redefining the definition of the Jamaican national or the Caribbean national in the landscape. And I can't say it without mentioning this, that the university has a three-pillared approach to a strategic plan, access, alignment, agility. What this does, Dr. Ferreira, you and your team, is that you have given us additional score points because we're connecting the dots across continents. We're using our own, our, our, our local expertise who, who punctuate um, continents across the world. And we're using their skill sets and their experiences. And we are saying that the university is a light in the West and, 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 and that we are here, we're here for, for the long haul. And it is important because the university is not just a place, it's a conglomerate of people who embrace a particular philosophy who are going, uh, who have a destination in mind. And this work helps us greatly along that trajectory. Finally, I, 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 I always love anything that reduces the gap between uh, theory and practice. We have lots of ideas but the ideas get us nowhere if they are not translated into usable um, 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 bits for, 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 for implementation on a day-to-day -day basis. So reading the studies, reading the abstracts, reading um, the, 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 the strategies that are shared in the classroom says that the theory has a connection to practice because what happens in the boardrooms must be informed by what happens in the classroom. And so this reduces that gap between uh, perspective and practice. So I believe that this work is significant in redefining the UWI graduate, not only regionally, but across the diaspora. People will pay attention to the fact that here are people who are good at what they do, who are bright, who are talented, who are reflecting, who are writing, who are using their experiences to, to, uh, as, as lanterns for the others. So I believe that this is particularly significant. <laughs> The ambassador of English and all of us who aspire to touch lives must be able to communicate effectively. Can't be an ambassador if you can't share your ideas. And given the power of access, it is amazing when you think about how it is that we are able to touch the world as a people. And if we are able to master the language that different persons speak, then we will be able to touch even more lives. In this particular instance, we are speaking about the English language, but let us not forget that knowledge is transferable. And so especially for those persons who are listening in on Newstalk 93FM, those persons who are tuning in and watching live on YouTube or joining us by Zoom. To communicate, you must be able to get your ideas understood. In this instance, we're speaking about a text 
that suggests ways in which in the first instance, we can apply that to the teaching and learning of English language. But even as a science educator, when you talk about text messaging, being an ambassador for the subject, being able to empower persons to share their ideas, using native tongue to, again, stimulate confidence, and then empowering persons to share these ideas on a global scale, using the vehicle of good communication skills, whether in English or in Spanish or French or Portuguese, this work is significant. And what I like out of many one, not just one Jamaica, but one world. And when you touch the world of academia, then you start to talk about oneness of ideas. And I'm very proud as a Jamaican, as an educator, to be rubbing shoulders with persons who are contributing to these ideas globally. Because let us not forget how significant the work of the University of the West Indies is when it comes on to the global platform of higher education. And so this is not just a body of work that is going to be positioned in just the Caribbean. And on that note, I am very, very pleased to announce that this book has been selected to be a part of the e-learning resources at the higher education level. And we're not just talking about the University of the West Indies, we're talking about anyone across the world that wants to talk about language education. And it is authored by our very own Caribbean nationals. Thanks again to Dr. Paulette Ferreira for providing this amazing opportunity to your students to not only learn, but to contribute towards education. Of course, as we work on our own practice, let us not forget the power of reflection. It is said that that is what we use to make sense of life. And so it would be remiss of us to not allow for an opportunity for reflection from teacher educators and trainers. With us, we have one such teacher educator, Mrs. Ardeen Reed Virtue, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Languages and Literature from the Church's Teachers College here in Jamaica. And it is with great pleasure that I invite her to share her own reflections on this work. Mrs. Ardeen Reed Virtue, lecturer from the Church's Teachers College. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches. You don't know, diverse book for a diverse set of people. Pauline Ferrer, big up your well bright collaborative self. <laughs> All right, the post method pedagogy is a rebellion against a traditional approach to teaching English. Formally, we thought that teachers are, you know, their role in the classroom is to implement, dicta, you know, whatever they, they are given to teach. And the post-method pedagogy says, teachers, you need to be active practitioners. And I have joined the rebellion. So I am here today with my placard. We want teachers as theorists. Boom. Yes. We want teachers as researchers. And we want teachers as transformational intellectuals. Do you like that? Well, I am loving it. Now, my chapter is entitled Stifled Teacher Efficacy, a Threat to Post-Method Pedagogy Implementation. While the PMP, Post-Method Pedagogy, advocates for teacher autonomy, the chapter recognizes that there are some contexts within which teachers operate that may prevent or impede their development of their agencies. So it calls for a reconstruction of school systems. For example, those schools that focus on the product, you know, preparing students to sit exams and being successful in getting the A's and so on. Those kinds of cultures sometimes do not facilitate teachers' autonomy or their development of agencies in the classroom. And in the tertiary context, I thought, 
How is it that we as teacher educators may prepare our students to become transformational intellectuals, theorists, researchers? And I considered the use of textbooks because teachers' over-reliance of textbooks is one of those factors that really function to impede the teacher as a researcher, someone who critically engages resources to ensure that they suit the student's background, the sociopolitical and cultural context, the classroom's unique situations. And so the chapter offers guidelines that can be used in methodology courses at the teacher training level to assist students with their what should I say, scientific and procedural use of textbooks in the classroom. Now, Dr. Smith did say that we teach students and not the curriculum. The same applies for the use of textbooks. Textbooks should no longer be seen as the dictator in the classroom, but teachers should engage them in a process of determining whether or not these materials really satisfy the objectives of lessons. Do they satisfy students' learning styles? Gone are the days when we thought that everything in a textbook is appropriate. Everything in a textbook is correct. So the teacher has to interrogate practice in order to analyze and determine selection, appropriacy, and effectiveness. And that is, in essence, what my chapter is about. Thank you. Joining the revolution here, live on the University of the West Indies campus. And I'm very happy that this is a revolution that has been authorized by the University of the West Indies. I don't have to worry about waving my own placard as I move through the campus. Along with Mrs. Ardeen Reed Virtue, we have another distinguished member of the faculty of the Church Teachers College, Dr. Anne Marie Wilmot, who serves in the capacity of head of department for the School of Languages and Literature, and she is Principal Lecturer at Church Teachers College. Let us make her welcome as she shares her own reflection on the work as it relates to teacher education and training. Dr. Anne-Marie Wilmot. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone, or greetings, everyone, I should say. My chapter, chapter 11, is mobilizing departments of English for the postmodern um, paradigm. And I looked at how we can empower heads of department to make that transition. Now, one of the ways that we can view post-method pedagogy is as the attempts of teachers really to make the necessary adjustments and modifications to methods that are already established, but they will align these with the realities of their local context in order to recre recreate those methods as their own. So my chapter recognizes the immersive nature of teacher training programs and also notes that the colleges cannot teach everything that pre-service teachers should know in the sort of depth that they should know it. So what this means is that the culture of the department that receives them when they go out in the, in the field of work will play a very crucial role in the continued development of these teachers to the point where they will embrace and they will also enact their post-method pedagogies. So I argue then that the head of department in is um, the head of department is best positioned as one of the most significant contributors to any change efforts in school. And this also includes the mobilizing efforts to achieve an effective post method English language department. And so I discussed the post method English language department, the characteristics of the teachers in this department, what the profile of the HOD looks like, and also what sorts of collaborative efforts they would undertake. I then examined some of the challenges that would impede this repositioning because we're not currently operated on operating under the post-method um, paradigm now. So we I looked at the challenges that would 
impact the repositioning to take on post-method dispositions. And after that, I suggested a pathway that HODs can take to make a, um, a successful transition to empowering the members of their department to embrace post-method pedagogy. I want to think that I place very high value on the this book project as it relates to teacher education. I think that the, the, the ways in which the, the activities of the text, the production of the text came together, I feel that that supports a culture of research generally, but specifically in the ways the, in which the author, um, Dr. Polly Ferrer was able to coalesce the, the contributors and the ways in which she energized us from start to finish. I think that that is really truly remarkable and that is something that is worth emulation. I think that given the increased demand for higher education practitioners to engage in research, and given that the research culture is emerging among some institutions, teacher um, teacher colleges um, included among these, I feel that the work then becomes a model of what is possible. And for me, that is one of the biggest achievements of this text. It is a model of what is possible when one educator decides to invest trust in and mentors others and how that initial investment of trust and how that mentoring has this exciting domino effect on others. So I close by saying thank you, Dr. Ferreira and fellow contributors for making this project possible. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Anne-Marie Wilmot, head of department at the Church Teachers College for sharing your own ideas. And it particularly struck me as a school principal where you mentioned the power and importance of the work of the heads of departments at the receiving schools when teachers leave colleges and start their careers. Powerful work. That's a particular chapter. I've made a notation. Read that one twice. So thank you so much for that. Ms. Tracy Ann Beckford, instructor, language, linguistics, and philosophy here at the University of the West Indies. Thank you so much for the work that you have done. And I look forward to know, as I invite you to the virtual lectern, your own reflections on the process and the work. Good afternoon, Ms. everyone. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much. Chapter eight, titled The Implications of Text Messaging for Language Teaching, is based on my quantitative research on the impact of text messaging on the form of grade nine students' writing. I found that the students in the sample used very few text forms in their academic writing, which might be very surprising to some. And it was found that those who actually used text forms in their writing were the higher performing students. It seems then that text messaging is having a slightly positive impact on the writing of students. Consequently, much of the information that is presented in the chapter seeks to allay fears of the harmful impact of texting. However, the concerns about aspects of writing, such as spelling and punctuation, are not ignored, though these seem to be under threat. Instead, the chapter presents approaches that aim to quell such fears. Chapter eight therefore presents the global and Caribbean perspectives on text messaging and students' writing and suggests ways in which text messaging can be used to enhance language learning. In terms of teacher education and the role of this chapter, in chapter eight, 21st century educators are encouraged to consider the languages of their students and how to use their awareness of this to motivate learning and present content in creative ways. 
The chapter provides insight into the cognitive processes that are involved in language learning and texting. There is an overview of the nuances of learning English in a Creole speaking environment and what happens when the language of texting is added to the mix. The chapter is very useful to teacher education as it presents the critical issues involved in teaching English in a post method paradigm and suggests practical ways to help students to code switch and use text messaging to improve their English writing skills. Recently, as we all know, we have become even more digital. And so teacher educators need to uncover tools to enable future teachers to build phonemic awareness, improve literacy, while motivating students to learn English. This chapter tells you how to do just that. Dr. Ferreira, colleagues, I thank you. I was so surprised when you said it was the higher achieving students that tended to include text language and that it was actually helping. Thank God because of COVID, we, we allow the phones and stuff in school now. I feel more justified in knowing that this is actually helping because we make some bold decisions as school administrators. And isn't it amazing when research backs up that gut instinct that you have and the willingness to take that chance? Phenomenal work. You don't know what you've done for me in my next staff meeting. Do you see this grin? I am excited. We also have with us Ms. Kashima Martin and thank her so much for submitting her pre-recorded message. She is a former student of the University of the West Indies and she is a teacher of English language, literature and communication studies at the St. Thomas Technical High School. We are very excited to hear her message as that builds on her over 13 years of experience in teaching. She is currently in the first year of doing her master's in language education, and that is another phenomenal opportunity. Let us pay keen attention to the message from Ms. Kashima Martin that's pre-recorded and will be followed right after by an item by Miss Cindy Payne, Teacher of English, Digital Pioneers Academy in Washington, DC. Listen up closely and then enjoy the item right after Miss Martin's reflection. Good day, I am Kashima Martin, a teacher of English for the past 13 years and also a master's student at the University of the West Indies, Mona, where, I'm, where I am pursuing my degree in language education at the School of Education. What does the post-method paradigm means to me as a teacher of English language? The post-method paradigm means that as a teacher, I am now able to feel empowered to, to create strategies and techniques to use within my classroom, strategies that are particular to my, to my students and our learning and teaching context. It also means that I am able to come up with strategies that are practical within the possibilities of my role as a classroom teacher. Therefore, for me, Post-method paradigm is about empowering me as a teacher and also allowing me to own my craft as I seek to help my students to develop awareness and competency in the use of standard Jamaican English. Therefore, I do believe and I endorse Dr. Paulette Ferreira's book, which speaks about teaching English language within a post-method paradigm, as I believe that this paradigm will help to empower other classroom teachers like myself to find innovative strategies that we can use to reach our students as we seek to develop them as global citizens within this 21st century and beyond. I thank you. 
Otto Paula Ferreira, and to Vicky to me, let me just say congratulations on this milestone. And yes, it is your shining time. So here is Master Griffith's shining time dedicated to you. You've seen it all with your two eyes. You felt the pain. You faked the smile. You've walked the road, but never alone. Thank you, Lord, it's shining time at last. And it feels like shining time at last. Yes, it feels like shining time at last. All the seeds you have sown have finally grown. It feels like shining time at last. You've had some doubts, you've had some fears, you've had some doubts, but through it all, you've stood your ground, oh, you've made it through the broken glass. Thank you, Lord, it's shining time at last. And it seems like shining time at last. Yes, it feels like shining time at last. All the seeds you've sown have finally grown. It feels like shining time at last. Yes, it feels like shining time at last. Yes, it feels like shining time at last. All the seeds you have sown have finally grown and it feels like shining time at last it feels like shining time at last could not have picked a more fitting song for this moment Throughout this afternoon's launch, we have been reminded of the importance of teaching the four basic skills of English, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Through the review of just under the 15 chapters, we have been provided with a plethora, a plethora of tips, a plethora of tricks, fantastic ideas, through skillfully crafted and worded recommendations in each chapter. We have been provided through this publication with a means of constructing our pedagogy and ways of refining our practice as we reflect on our own philosophies and the philosophies that we want our lives to embody. It is with great honor that I take this opportunity to have everyone just sit up, get ready. We're going to hear from Dr. Ferreira herself. She is a lecturer, a motivator, a door opener, personal trainer, because I'm sure for everyone who wrote those chapters, there were moments when it felt like you were being stretched. But look at what has been accomplished. And as we celebrate you, Dr. Ferreira, it is with honor that I shed the light on you and your co-authors for the phenomenal work that you have produced along with your team. Let us give a resounding round of applause to Dr. Ferreira as she comes to the lectern at this time. 
Thank you, Mrs. Joan. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Marie Smith, our University Registrar and Chief Administrator. Professor Minerva James, Director of Graduate Studies and Research. And of course, others have greeted us before, Dr. Gartan Anderson, Dean of Teachers College Jamaica and the Principal of Church Teachers College and my own Director of the School of Education, Dr. Marcia Rainford, and all of the persons who have participated in this program. The time has come for me to respond and I'm going to surprise you because you know I chat a lot and I'll try to be so quick. <laughs> You'll be surprised. And of course, I want to welcome, I know they closed a the new stock, you know, so I've been you know, already, but I mean, our viewers are still out there all over the globe. Nari, it's almost your bedtime, 10, 10 o'clock somewhere. Yeah, right. Okay, so I appreciate that. You know, John Alter Baker, in his book, Dr. Smith, Paradigm, The Business of Discovering the Future, he talks about two persons and make a contrast with them. You know, he asks the question, who is the pioneer and who is the settler? And so he said that the settler paused towards the horizon, you know, out there and said, is it safe out there? And he said, the voice that answers is the voice of the pioneer who says, yes, it is safe. And so he believes that pioneers take the risk to go out early and to make the territory safe. It is the paradigm pioneers who are the first to follow the rough pathway that paradigm shifters have uncovered. I guess you're now asking the question, who is the shifter? <laughs> okay, a good question. Dr. Marcia Rainford, it is with great pleasure that the School of Education can today say that Another paradigm has shifted from our school because we have to acknowledge that the shift up par excellence was the late Dennis, Professor Dennis Roy Craig, who my students have talked about. And he pioneered English language teaching throughout the Caribbean waters. You know, he looked out for all the methods that he could find coming from especially our Eurocentric methods and he augmented them, put, brought back all the goodies for the teachers here. He's the godfather for language education for our teachers of English and he pioneered that. And now today, another shift has come from the School of Education. And this time, we are taking the teachers with us. We have taken them with us. This is what my shift is about. This time, we're not waiting for the goodies to come back. We have those to constantly consult, you know, because all the scholarship is there, added to like Velma Pollard, Beverly Bryan, and all the others who have done that, that my students have consulted. And I used to ask them, what do you say? That's what I'm noted for. So what do you say? when they all have the opines and the contents and the this. I said, what is it that you have to contribute? And today I'm happy. I afforded them the privilege as captain of this ship. We talk about the horizon and we say, we see it. We see it. We see where the sky meets the sea. And yet we are led to believe that it doesn't exist. How can I see it, Dr. Smith, and it doesn't exist? And I'm seeing it. I see where it meets. And any journey that we embark on, any waters that we go into and we stay on the shores, thinking that it is supposedly safe along the shoreline, we'll never get to embark on the new territories. And so as my crew and I sail, <laughs> we went on to the new horizon and planted the university flag, yes right there in mainstream discourse with all the international game changers, they say, you know, and so it is with great privilege and pride that I say to God be the glory for being the captain of this ship and my loyal crew who never jumped ship, 
Even while they were studying and doing their own work, they found that they had to commit to this journey. And so today we are celebrating ourselves and lauding our teachers for the magnificent work that they have contributed to this. And what is amazing about this journey, what it does, it validates our indigenous practice in the face of the international. Being virtual chat out. <laughs> That's it. You know, I did it just that right I did. Yes. In the mainstream waters, and this is what is special. This is what we are celebrating. If this isn't what we call agility, if this isn't, if this isn't what we call access, if this isn't what we say, moving our strategic vision and plans ahead, then I can't think of anything else. And so today I challenge them to continue the pioneering scholarship because you can't jump ship at this time. My charge is to the graduates in the teachers' colleges, in their own classroom. This is a local product, as local as you say in both. Is that what you said? Yes, with, with something unique that the world wants. And I said, to the world. <laughs> Isn't that what Bolton have said? And so it gives me that honor and privilege to be a part of that journey and to thank you. Thank you, all of my contributors. And I particularly want to thank the collaborative efforts that I, you know, for the persons like, especially a salmon in the university, the British University of Dubai. She was the first person who answered the call and perhaps led me to feel committed to do the mentorship for everybody else. And so thank you all. Thank you all for this profound milestone. And I say, continue, continue the search. Um, Kashima Martin, you were invited to be part of this because you symbolically represent the fact that we must continue to engage our students in the ongoing research while they study. Because Dr. Smith, too often they feel that the research project that they do at the end of their study, I eat that. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's just the beginning. And these contributors have testified that that scholarship needs to be blended with their own practice for the ongoing search. And so I think we have placed this kind of model in the hands of those who we can trust. And Professor Thane, yes, that's what you're accustomed to in the medical field. And the word has gone out. The UWR Register witnessed it. <laughs> We all heard it. It's a challenge to all the faculties that this is the way to go, to be the collaborative, you know, blending our own UWI product with the international scholars across the globe. Because as Marie said at the beginning, we are everywhere and we bring something profound and special to the field. And so it gives me great pleasure to hand over this copy of the book to our library. And I think the person who is going to receive that, I'm sure our master of ceremonies will do the honors for that. And while we're not selling the book now, the bottom line is that as I give it to the Mona library, it also goes on the shelf of all the libraries across the globe in its e-collection form. And so this is my gift to you from all of us who journey to the horizon and back. And we'll go again for the other journey because this is going to be the start of a prolific journey of researchers who must sustain English language teaching in a post modern paradigm to remain relevant and valuable, you know, and add value to English language teaching in this century. God bless you and thank you.
Dr. Ferreira, your response was as profound as the content of your book, and so was your charge for us to continue to collaborate. Thank you so much for donating a copy of your book to the University of the West Indies Library. And to receive that on behalf of the University of the West Indies is Miss Audrey Sadler, Librarian, Systems Unit at the main library here at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. Miss Audrey Sadler. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the UE Mona Library and Dr. Paulette Carr, Dr. Ferreira, we would like to extend our heartiest congratulations to you and your team on this latest publication, which adds to the body of knowledge on the English language teaching in a post paradigm shift. And it is with a deep sense of pleasure that I accept this copy on behalf of the Mona Library, which will be added to our special collections and will become a gem of one of the publications emanating from the Mona campus. We wish you well and thank you most graciously. Thank you so much, Miss Sadler. It means that not only will the University of the West Indies have a copy, but remember what Dr. Ferreira mentioned, it will be available across the globe as a part of IGI's e-book collection. We have come to the end of an amazing afternoon. But we know that in all things, we put God first and we maintain a grateful spirit. To do the, offer the vote of thanks, I would like to invite Dr. Anne-Marie Wilmot, Head of Department, School of Languages and Literature and Principal Lecturer at the Church Teachers College. Dr. Anne-Marie Wilmot. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <laughs> Dr. Murray Smith, our keynote speaker, and Mrs. Aniona Jones, Chairman, Dr. Marcia Rainford, um, School Director, Dr. Paulette Ferreira, author, fellow contributors, guests at the various social media. It is a privilege to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks to the organizers and the implementers, the contributors and participants whose collective energies have made the launch of Dr. Paulette Ferreira's book a success on behalf of the School of Education, the UE Mona. Gertrude Steen reflects that silent gratitude isn't very much used to anyone. So it is with this, within this context that I would love to begin by saying, Mrs. Anonia Jones, thank you so much for the impressively lively and engaging ways in which you energize the audience from the start of the journey to its near conclusion and for your very insightful commentaries. We thank you so much. Mrs. Keisha Smith Davis, special thanks for having invoked the presence of God within this, this, this function. And, and for thanking him for the very abilities that we have to create and to collaborate, to produce intellectual work, and for just remaining in the program and reminding us of the value that of the, the value of paying forward, of giving back. And to Dr. Yuandi Lewis Fukrom for extending to all the guests and colleagues at the UE Mona and in other parts of the world for that very extensive recognitions of friends and families of viewers and for the hearty welcome and the kind words to all, we thank you so much. Then we say special thanks to the persons who brought greetings. 
Dr. Marcia Rainford, who is the director of the School of Education at the UEMONA, Professor Minerva Thames, campus coordinator in the graduate studies and research at the UEMONA, and Dr. Garth Anderson, who is the principal of Church Teachers College and the Dean of Col Teachers Colleges of Jamaica. We really wish to thank you all. And not only for the congratulatory sentiments of your greetings, but to, to register that collectively, you validate the significance of this publication, your acknowledgement of the effort, the dedication, the energy, the sacrifice and skills necessary for this achievement is an inspiration to us and will remain so for quite some time. Dr. Aisha Spencer, um, most persons find it very difficult to introduce an erudite presenter and scholar like our keynote speaker. But your thoughtfulness in the preparation and the ease of presentation was extremely helpful in laying the foundation for the elevated expectations in us, the trust, the confidence, and the openness with which we received him and he did not disappoint. Dr. Maurice Smith, University Registrar. Always a treat to listen to. Thanks for inviting us to reflect on our pedagogy with the view of understanding the nature of interactive instruction and how our own practices are aligned to the tenets of this theory specifically related to how we train teachers to teach English and how we teach our students to learn English. And then we had these performers who broke the temples for us and did so amazingly with their items. Miss Shanice White, thank you so much for reminding us that we are winners, but we must remember to keep humble and that gratitude is a must. Miss Payne, what can I say? It's shining time at last. And boy, did we shine. Thank you so much, ladies, for your heartfelt rendition. And then we had those persons, nine persons who participated in the reflection. Mrs. Paula Ferreira Davis, Dr. Dan, um, Janice Jules, uh, Miss Neri McLean McLeod, Thanks for helping us understand the significance of the research on the international arena. And then Ms. Nevita Roberts, Ms. Yone Donald, Ms. George Delevanti, who are graduate students and helped us to understand what this project meant to you from your perspective. We are grateful that you decided to share with us. And then we'd wish to thank Mrs. Ardid Reed Virtue, Mrs. Tracy and Beckford for sharing the value of the work in the diaspora, the international teacher educate to international teacher education, particularly its usefulness in the richness of the content it provides and the various pedagogical pathways that it, that it offers. We really thank you for your, for your contribution. Dr. Paulette Ferreira, we are really very, amazed at always at your articulateness and this afternoon it was no different. We note very carefully how you brought to bear the collective efforts of everyone and even those who path away before you, you took some time to share your light with them. That has not been lost on any of us and we are grateful and we do we hope that you will continue on this journey of sharing and mentoring because many persons are benefiting and will continue to benefit from the work that you do. We thank you so much. We thank Miss Audrey Sadler for accepting um, a copy on behalf of her supervisor. Now, I would like to thank our listeners who tuned in via News Talk 93FM, our viewers on YouTube and all the other 
social media platforms as well as those in the live audience. We were really, really, really delighted to have you. Um, there are also some other individuals without whose skills and expertise and knowledge and competence this launch might not have been as smooth as it was. So I wish to thank the publishers of the text, IGL Global, for the supportive online structures that ensures each the contributors meet their deadlines on time. And to Newstalk 93FM, the technicians and host of the Radioactive Classroom for their collaboration with SOE, um, Mrs. Miss, Mrs. Darcia Watson and her team, and for everyone, every single one who provided any kind of support in any way, in any shape, in any form. Thank you a million. Your efforts made this afternoon possible and we are extremely grateful. Thank you very much. <laughs>